And joining us now in studio is the Industrialization and Agriculture, I believe, Cabinet Secretary Adam Mohammed. Thank you for coming in. You know, your responsiveness to this issue has been questioned because this is something that has been in the public domain uh, and a debate for over a week now. Why is it that you're only just now speaking out about it? Well, I, I think uh, the reason why we continue to speak about it is because many people, uh, especially the key stakeholders who are affected, seem to be getting conflicting messages from different actors in the country. And so we wanted to make sure that we put the record straight. And hopefully this will bring this debate of whether a sugar deal was signed or not signed. And so the official position of government is no deal was signed relating to sugar or any other deal in Uganda during the president's visit. And you know, even while you say that, just this evening, still rumors were swirling that now allegedly Uganda has acknowledged that a deal was signed. Why do you think that there's so much mistrust um, on the side of uh, you know, the public and as far as whether or not in fact this deal was signed? Why is this such a, a big deal? Well, I don't think uh, you know, we can say this mistrust between what the government is saying and what the public is perceiving. It's just that this is being used as a way of misinforming the public. And we just want to make sure that before it gets to that level, we keep records straight and everybody understand what actually happened. Because this is a sensitive issue and the people who are affected, the farmers, the millers, the consumers, all need to understand what is this actually about. Because if everybody talks about it in different places, if a lie is told many times, it might just look like the truth. And so we are putting an official position out and we will be putting that on the newspapers, on the paid for art tomorrow, just to make sure that this debate of a deal or no deal comes to an end. And then we can talk about other things relating to sugar, which we are prepared to do. Yeah, and, and I suppose uh, the concern I think which is there is that if th th this was like government sort of scoring an own goal, the worst possible example of poor communications, but this is where it gets perhaps poorer for some, is the misunderstanding of the various uh, trade deals that Kenya has signed, specifically uh, Kamesa and EAC. And just for the purposes, you know, of debunking myths, I, I want you to just run Kenyans through the four freedoms that have been agreed to with this uh, two protocols in as far as movement of goods, labor, services, and capital is concerned, and how that affects Kenyan producers and consumers. Well, first of all, the issue that has become you know, the talk of every, you know, if everybody, politicians and civil society and the farmers or everyone, is whether actually we can import sugar from Uganda or not. In fact, there was no need for a deal even if we were to import sugar from Uganda. So we have been importing sugar from Uganda since 1997. And we will continue to do that but we make sure we do that in a controlled manner so that it doesn't affect our industry here in the country. And so we also have you know, uh, provisions under COMESA where we have asked for extension to avoid significant volumes of sugar coming into Kenya from COMESA until we get our sugar sector competitive into a position where we can actually compete and that protocol has been respected we continue to respect we are building it key parts of making sure that that happens is we accept a certain quota and we have to do certain things ourselves including privatizing some of the mills so that efficiencies and improvements can make our sector and our sugar sector actually competitive that is one of the things that is very important and look Comesa is a free trade area, we are signatories to that, and we've got to operate within those rules. And in as far, just uh, to take, cut you short, I beg your pardon, in as far as sugar specifically and Comesa is concerned, we've been, you know, this is not the first time, you, you know, you, we can you know, lobbied for an extension. Are you going to lobby for another one? Or well, is this it? It, it, would, it? it depends. We are having conversation with the millers, we are having some specific challenges with certain key players like Mumias, as you obviously know. Yeah. And so the current uh, extension that we've sought expires sometimes in quarter one of next year. And we have started the program of privatization. Mm -hmm. So 
we will, once we get to that particular point, mm -hmm. see our preparedness. I think a lot has been done in terms of infrastructure development to make sure that our sugar industry is improving on a continuous basis. Some of the numbers that have been thrown out, like $870 is the cost of production, doesn't actually make sense. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, Miller sells sugar at $640 dollars or thereabouts. So the cost of production is somewhere in the region of $500 or, lo or, or lower. Right. So we are improving and what the sugar mills are asking for is just to make sure that we are actually given a fair playing field for them to be able to operate and compete with the rest of the world. Alright, let me just take you back to, to my initial question which was just sort of help Kenyans understand what they should expect to see on their shelves from other countries uh, in as far as Comesa is concerned. What producers, uh, y you know, should be aware of in terms of the opening up of the market, the movement of persons, the movement of capital, because in as far as all these agreements have been made, I think there isn't enough information in the public domain, unless you're specifically interested in trade, you know, to know what exactly these two deals mean. Well, first of all, as far as sugar is concerned, we have a shortage of about 260,000 metric tons compared to between what we produce and what we consume. Now, that deficit and that gap has to be imported, and we have been importing that for a long time. And so what we are saying is we want to make sure that that deficit is imported into the country in a controlled manner. In 2010, we imported 260,000 uh, you know, tons uh, of, of sugar, and it's been around that number between 180 to 260,000 metric tons. So that has been the case, it's not something that is new. Now, the way we seek to do that is if we have that shortfall, do it from East African community first, because this is a, co a region, a common market. If we don't exhaust that, we then go to Comesa. And if we can exhaust Comesa, we go to the rest of the world. And so that is really an important issue for us to appreciate that we supply our needs from our industry players in Kenya. If we have a deficit after that, we go to East Africa. After that, Comesa. Because these are all free trade areas that we are signatories to. Okay. So that is actually what we should expect. Mm -hmm. And we are confident that up to now, Comesa is able to fulfill our needs. Mm -hmm. And our preference is in the first instance, go to East African community and then go to Comesa as well. Fair enough. CS, stay with me for a little bit. We're taking a short break. We're back with more after this. So please do send in your questions. 22422 is our SMS line. We're still joined by the Industrialization and Agriculture Cabinet Secretary. As we wind up, uh, CS, I just want to mention that the clip that is circulating in social media that I had alluded to in the first part of this interview, um, the, quoting the, U government, the, the Ugandan government on a deal, is from March 2015. But the point that you are making is that even if something was signed in March, there is no need for a deal for Kenya to do business with Uganda. Well, we have an East African common market, which right. is something that all the East African countries have signed to. And so there's free movement of goods, uh, people, capital f across the borders. So right. as a matter of fact, we don't need any agreement to right. do trade between the East African countries. As one already exists. Exactly. Okay, right, fine. Uh, finally, I just want to talk about uh, competitiveness because even if you listen to the argument of the opposition, it's really about how does this, you know, disenfranchise uh, the farmer. So what are you doing specifically uh, in regards to sugar, you know, in keeping Kenyan sugar competitive? And then let's talk about now, broadly speaking, with EAC, EAC uh, common market. What are you doing to keep our homegrown industries competitive? Well, I think our number one priority, first of all, is to our sugar mills and make sure that they're able to compete effectively with international players, including the regional players. And so as of today, we have not been in a position to be competitive. And that's for a whole raft of reasons. If you look at the whole supply chain, starting from the cane growing of the farmers to the mills mm -hmm. and to the access to various markets, there are a number of issues. And I think there are countries that have perfected this much longer than us. So one of the key things that will make a difference for us in future is if government gets out of the business of mills, and so the privatization process 
that has already started would play a key role. And that is why today you see a number of private mills mm -hmm. are profitable, are doing well. And the ones that have been running the public space has not been that efficient. And so there are quite a number of other broader issues that are mill specific, similar to the kind of issues that faced Mumias, the governance issues, allegations of corruption and so on and so forth. And so if you talk to farmers, as I did, uh, you know, sometimes today and yesterday, you hear all sorts of things about how expensive it is to transport cane right. within the particular area. Mm -hmm. So we are working with each of these stakeholder groups mm -hmm. to make sure that we can address some of those because our priority is to make sure that our sector in the country is competitive and are able to actually face the challenge because if you think about it we have a quota today that we have set mm -hmm. there are countries in Comesa that today have access to EU markets and those access will be blocked and so most of that sugar will itself come back into Africa again and so the challenge is very clear the millers understand what they need to do mm -hmm. we believe Mumias alone could add another hundred thousand metric tons you know, in the next three years if it's able to do its work and its homework. Mm -hmm. And that is why the government is going out of its way to support very, very proactively companies like Mumias despite having a very small stake in that business. Right. And so, so I think uh, we are ready for it. The stakeholders ultimately would be the ones who will make that happen for us with the support that we're giving. And government has done a lot in making sure that the firmers, more than anyone else within that supply chain, are actually looked after through payments to farmers, as you have seen the recent payment of one billion to Mumias and five hundred to, mm -hmm. you know, Sony and another billion to Zoya mm -hmm. and Chemilil as well. So right. a lot of those things are going on. Mm -hmm. We have continuous dialogue to make sure that we remain competitive and are able to deal with any challenges. And I suppose, uh, in as far as you know, th those financial injections you're talking about is concerned. The the argument is that we need more money than the one billion and, and to see, quote unquote, the actual game plan for recovery for these industries. But for your time, because we must wind up, I thank you so much for coming to the studio. Uh, CS Adam Mohammed of Industrialization and Agriculture.